Well, it starts with large wire. Um, we haven't got the space here to do actual melting and forging ingots and that sort of thing. So uh, we have that done to, to the right specification. This is several materials. This is yellow brass, which is 7030 copper to zinc, red brass, which is 9010, and the uh, various, uh, we make several different iron wires as well. So um, after casting ingots, the wire is then rolled and at around about half an inch diameter, it's turned into rod which can then be drawn and it comes to us in huge coils of um, large wire basically. From that stage uh, we anneal the wire here in the furnace because you need to do that uh, exactly the same every time. Temperature and time are both critical. So the, the secret really is the last annealing temperature, time and diameter because from that point all the wires are then drawn on cold and they have to have the right properties at the finished size, not at the annealed size. It's mostly to do with the strength. Um, when, when I was setting up this business to begin with, um, and studying metallurgy with, with a metallurgist who had a whole laboratory, um, we realised that the wires in use uh, in the 17th, 18th century were critically stressed. So the strength of the wire is very closely limited to the speaking length and therefore the tension that's going to be on the wire when it's in use. Uh, so if you get that right, the mechanical side, the elasticity and plasticity tends to look after itself. After annealing, then it's heavy drawing work, and uh, that's, down, down, that's done downstairs uh, with a machine which works from coil to coil. Um, basically, it, it's, um, it's a period machine. It's from the 1920s, I think. It draws the wire onto a, a big cast cylinder um, looking like a huge top hat basically, which is very slightly conical. And then as the wire feeds in at the bottom, it manages to push the previous coil upwards and it goes on doing that, feeding the coil upwards. So you end up with a coil of wire, which you can then pick up, put back to the beginning again and do the whole thing again. Most drawing time does not result in finished wire. It's, it's um, the many, many stages. The largest size of iron you would have on a harpsichord has been drawn about 25 times by the time you get to that finished size. Uh, we make batches of round about 17 kilograms generally. So the big machine downstairs will be running that um, probably over about three days and then it would come upstairs and there would be another uh, three days of running that whole batch through. And then we start, as it gets smaller, we start to split it up uh, into batches of maybe a quarter of that amount, so maybe four or five kilograms at a time. It's been interesting to see how it replicates um, the early experience. Um, wire drawing was for the European market was for centuries done in Nuremberg. That was really the centre of metal bashing as it's called technically. And um, the guilds there were very very tightly in control and the people who really knew the secrets were barely allowed out of the city. So of course nothing was written down and you have to glean little bits of information about how, how they were doing and what their sources were and, and so on. And um, they clearly had the same uh, experience of handling large amounts of wire because they had uh, what they called the Krobdradzia, which is the, the drawers of large wire, who were very general. They were making wire for all sorts of, of purposes, even for handles, for buckets and, and that sort of thing. And then they had the Scheibenseer, who are clearly um, what we would call reel to reel. So they had the same experience that after a certain time, 
you can't draw coil to coil anymore because it grips too much on the drawing block. So you then have to work reel to reel in smaller quantities. So what we found, logically enough, has, has really um, simply mirrored what they were doing in those days. There is a fascinating book um, by one Weigel of about 1690, I think, um, which shows pictures of many trades, including the wire drawers, many, many trades, the trumpet makers, there's um, vial makers, there's bucket makers, there's people rolling brass into a thin sheet, uh, which would then be the, the source material for the trumpet makers and so on. So you can see quite a lot there. And then there's fairly oblique references um, all over the place in early writings, but never exactly the information that you need to know. It is detective work. Yes, it's the same later on once the patent system was established. If you look really closely at, uh, at technical patents, the vital bit of information is not there because patents, of course, were available to the public. So you did everything you could to obscure the, the actual vital bit of, of your patent.